In the beautiful rolling hills of West Coast New Zealand resides 700 members of a community whose ultimate goal is to live to serve Jesus. But what darkness may hide in this beautiful community? Good afternoon everyone and welcome back to my channel and Killer Concepts, the place where we talk about all things true crime. My name is Peyton. Before we get started, please make sure to hit that red subscribe button down below and turn on your post notifications so you do not miss any future content. I know yet again my video this week is late, but I promise I am working to get back on schedule. There has just been a lot going on as of lately and if I'm honest, I've been on a a reading binge. I love to read. I read a lot of books, a lot of different genres, and that's actually how I found this story to talk about today. Every once in a while I like to go to Books A Million to check out their bargain section and recently I went and bought four new true crime books that I can use to help me with my research and content for my videos. One of the books I purchased was called The Truth Behind the World's Most Notorious Cults by Nigel Calthorne. In this book, Calthorne discusses about 48 different cults or what he considers cults anyway and gives you a little background on them and where they are today. There are some in here you may not consider cults, but so far I have really liked the book. One of the cults he talks about in the book is called the Cooperites or Gloryvale Christian Community. This is who we will be talking about today. So this may be a shorter video and I may be a little bit opinionated in this one, but it's hard not to be when such ridiculous things happen in these organizations. to a bigger location. So who was Neville Cooper? Neville Cooper grew up in Australia and would marry his wife Gloria when she was just 16 years old. According to Cawthorn, quote, he was a forceful man and she was passive and compliant, end quote. But even so, it was a pretty happy marriage, at least from the outside, what people saw. Cooper had long devoted his life to God and he preached around Australia, calling his mission the voice of deliverance. But it was never really successful but eventually it would become successful once he moved it to New Zealand. So Cawthorn also notes that Cooper's mission had very strong statements that helped to attract followers such as quote those who were saved would enjoy everlasting life in heaven while sinners would suffer eternal damnation in hell. End quote. One of his followers would even donate him an airplane. One day, his wife, when she was pregnant with their 10th of 16 children, would go with him and two other missionaries on a trip to Kulangata when the plane's engine would fail at 1,000 feet. However, everyone on the plane would survive the crash. They would end up camping out for like three days. Cooper apparently had to swim a really long distance to go and and get help. Well, of course, their survival would spark a new campaign for Cooper, stating that it was God and only God who had delivered them from death. This would only make Cooper more popular in his teachings, and in 1969, he would relocate himself and his growing family to New Zealand to start the Springbank Community Church near Christchurch. He never really had an opportunity like this in Australia, and that is why they would move to New Zealand. Here they would follow strict religious guidelines that he had set forth from the King James Version of the Bible. This can be found on 
Glory Vale's website. This is still what they follow till this day and everyone in the community works for free essentially. Farming, engineering, doing childcare, etc. And what money they do or they did make uh, would go and does go back into the community. So basically the people there have no real control over their money or possessions. Anything that they have isn't really theirs. They even live in group housing that is provided by the church. So Spring Bank over the years would only continue to gather more and more members and continue to grow. With this being the case, in 1991, they purchased a very large farm at the foot of the Southern Alps. This community would then be named after the founder's now deceased wife named Gloria, giving it the name Gloryville Community Church. At this time, Cooper would change his name to Hopeful Christian. This new land provided them many opportunities. They had two huge dairy farms. They produced Fagnum Moss and a deer farm that provided produced venison and velvet. They also had many other businesses that provided them with income. As I said before, they were pretty strict as they wanted to follow the word of God and Cooper did not want anything in the way of someone living their life for God. Due to this, they were all required to wear modest clothes and this is where the mainly blue and white dress code came from. Every once in a while, the women would get an opportunity to wear a pink dress for special occasions, but the women would wear blue and white dresses and they would wear white bonnets on their heads to keep modest. They were covered down to their ankles and they were covered up to their collarbone. It was against the rules to have makeup and jewelry. They actually couldn't even have wedding rings because Cooper said that they were of pagan religion. They were not Christian. So they were very bare minimum people. Women were to strive and are to strive to be homemakers. Like I said, this is still a community. From a young age, if they were to get pregnant, they were not allowed to have an abortion. That was not a thing in their community. And it is not a thing in their community. All women were to submit to men and men were to submit to the church authority members, such as Cooper. Children in Gloryville were expected to be completely obedient and when they were not there is several accounts that they were severely beaten many times in front of their peers as a warning in school they mainly taught the word of god and they were not allowed to play competitive sports they were also taught that the world outside of glory vale was full of sin and that is why they were to stay in the community now that we have gotten the gist of the glory vale community church we are now going to discuss a lot of the accusations against them. Keep in mind this place is still very much active and still very much real. Gloryvale Community Church has been scrutinized throughout the years and it only gets more and more frequent for them as more and more members of the community are starting to flee and distance themselves. With this comes many new accounts of survivors from this cult. One of the biggest accounts you can look at is that of Cooper's own son named Philip. Per Cawthorn, he had written a book called Sins of the Father in which he discusses all of the sexualization within the community. This includes sexual images and movies that were very common among the older men. He also apparently notes that he remembers watching his own father fondle his wife and not being able to do anything about it. They weren't going to speak against their leader or their founder or I am sure that Cooper considered himself a messiah. But even more disturbing, he mentions young girls being asked to get in the hot tub with the older men. The one linked down below is a news documentary called Leaving Glory Vale by One News. In this, many of the previous members who have escaped discuss this kind of sexual abuse. One woman in particular by the name of Victory Disciple is asked by the reporter on whether or not she experienced sexual abuse while there. She answers with a yes. You can see clear emotion about it. You can see how it has affected her. And she says that almost every other girl there that she knows has experienced the same thing. This is one of the reasons these families are starting to leave. Many of them were 
unfortunately so conditioned as a child growing up in the community that they did not even recognize the abuse. It took them to have children and be afraid for them to be subjected to this physical, mental, and sexual abuse for them to want to leave because they did not want it to happen to their children. It's also common in Glory Vale that women are not supposed to say no to their husbands. Women are not allowed to not consent to having sex with their husbands. So marital rape is very common in their community. It's just sad that a lot of the survivors of Glory Vale had to have children in order to see what really was happening to them as well. It's just really, really sad. Not only that, but the amount of physical abuse children suffer there is unfathomable. There have been reports of children being beaten or even starved for not completing chores. In December of 1995, Neville Cooper, also known as Hopeful Christian, the founder of Glory Vale, was sentenced to five years in prison for three counts of indecent assault. This was for, horrifyingly, inserting a wooden dildo into a 19-year-old woman over the course of three days. But this wasn't the only time he had been accused of doing these things. Many other women had come forward previously and had reported the abuse, but it just seems the Crown at the time had done nothing about it. They really dropped the ball. Much like Warren Jeffs from um, the FLDS church, he was still regarded highly within his community. Even when Cooper was serving time in prison, he was still giving instruction to his followers from his prison cell. And in an article from Vice, a woman by the name of Victoria Courage says she was assaulted as a child while sleeping in her own bed. She mentions the following reasons why it may be seen as okay within the community. Quote, the man that started the community, Hopeful Christian, was arrested and charged with sexual assault in the mid-90s. He covered it behind his Christianity, behind his ability as a public speaker, and I think his own dark demon integrated subtly through everything he talked about, she said. Quote, there's a few core teachings that he often spoke of publicly and privately. One was that a man cannot control his sexual drive. So it's up to the mother, the girls, and the wife to satisfy her husband. And then there's another layer where all the perpetrator has to do is repent. And then the victim says, I forgive you. Now it has never happened and God washes away our sins, end quote. One thing you must watch if you have never heard of this call, is the TED Talk I have linked down below by Cooper's own granddaughter. Please forgive me if I mispronounce her name, Lilia Terawa, one of 10 children in her immediate family. It is an extremely emotional TED Talk, but it is very moving. She talks about how she loved where she grew up until she hit the age where she had shown leadership qualities and her grandfather had made a mockery out of her in front of a bunch of people. Uh, she had gotten really good grades on her first report card and her teacher had mentioned that she had leadership qualities and when he gave it to her, she thought that he was really proud of her because she had gotten really great grades, but all he pointed out in front of everybody was that they did not want to see these qualities in women. They did not want to see women that could possibly become leaders because they did not want them to be able to speak or think for themselves. They wanted women to be homemakers there. She has now written a book called Daughter of Glory Vale, My Life in a Religious Cult. I really want to read this one. I'm going to have to add it to my reading list. In this book and her TED Talk, she apparently speaks about how when women begin menstruating within this community, they are considered old enough to be ready for marriage and sex. The only thing that kept her grandfather from marrying off young girls at 10 or 12 is the law in New Zealand that stated they couldn't marry until they were 16. They also did not have the opportunity to choose 
who they wanted to marry. Her grandfather was the one who would choose who would marry who within the community. Her grandfather and the other older men of higher rank within Gloryville were the ones who made all of the decisions within this cult, within this group of people. Neville Cooper, or Hopeful Christian, whichever name you want to call him, died in 2018 after a battle with cancer. But not before instilling fear and causing so much pain to so many people. As I said previously, this is still a very active cult, though they argue that they are not one and they prefer not to speak to reporters at all because nothing apparently ever good comes out of it. It literally states this on their website. So on their actual website, they actually have a fact section where they answer the question on whether or not they are a sect or cult. And this is their answer, quote, Neither. The word sect suggests a group that has become cut off from the main body or that leaves the main group in order to follow after some false leader. So the way this question is answered depends on what you know, believe, and understand about the history of the Christian church and about which group or groups you accept as being the main body of the church that has the true faith. End quote. They actually elaborate on this much further on their website. They have a whole page about their reasons why they are not a cult and what they consider themselves and their beliefs and what they follow. But this is all I'm going to share because it is just, it's too long to read it out on here. I personally very much consider them a cult. That's my opinion. But along with many of the people who have escaped living there, including Cooper's own granddaughter, considers them a cult. Places like this make me absolutely sick. People who call themselves Christians, but then harbor child abusers aren't real Christians in my opinion. They're just people hiding their crimes behind religion. While I am sure this community started out with really good intentions. It just doesn't seem like it has stayed that way over the years and probably shouldn't be running at this point at all. My heart goes out to anyone who has experienced trauma from a place like this and my heart goes out to the people who are still there. If they choose to stay, I truly hope things get better for them. With that being said, that is all I have on my video on the Cooperites and the Gloryville Christian community. I know this one kind of bounced all over the place. It wasn't like in chronological order or anything necessarily like that. I really wasn't familiar with the Cooperites or Gloryville at all. I decided to share it with you when I was reading my cults book that I said that I had just bought by Nigel Cawthorn. I have, I had never heard of them before. Cults have always fascinated me though, and I am sure we will continue to talk about more of them in the future. I want to talk about some of them that we're not very familiar with. I mean, like this book, the cover of it is you know, Charles Manson. I don't want to necessarily talk about the Manson family. I had considered it before, but so many people have covered the Manson family. With that being said, please make sure to hit the red subscribe button down below and turn on your post notifications so you do not miss any future content. If you have not done so already, if you have any case suggestions, please send them to killerconceptsvlog at gmail.com or comment them down below in the description box. You can also follow me on social media. All those links are down below. I would say right now I'm probably most active on X. I've been really using it lately just for my thoughts. So if you want to follow me on there, that's great. Before you go, just remember that the world's most dangerous minds hide in the most unlikely places. Stay safe.